Well, Father, we appreciate your presence here with us. We thank you, Father, that you are always with us, that you have sent us a, a comforter and a helper, <clears throat> that just as your son said, one that will never leave us nor forsake us, one that will abide with us. Father, we thank you for this time together. We, Lord, we appreciate your word. We appreciate the truth of your word, that we can order our lives according to it, and that by your spirit, your will will be done through our life. Father, we give you praise, we give you glory, and Father, I thank you that you are guiding the church in the direction that you desire it to be. So Father, we praise you, we worship you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, <clears throat> if you want to have a seat, you can go ahead. Matt, I want to get you to get around a little bit and here in just a minute, just introduce yourselves and get to know everybody. We appreciate everybody coming out this morning. We're going to be covering some ground that we um, actually started last week, and we're going to continue that on along those lines. So now, <clears throat> looking at a couple of things here. First off, I guess I have to make all the normal announcements. First off, silence all devices, phones, pagers, all that kind of stuff. I don't even know if anybody uses pagers anymore. I haven't seen one in a while, I guess. I don't know. But <clears throat> also, uh, yeah, if you either, I guess at some point you need to either put them on vibrate, silence them, Tone them down, whatever it is you have to do. Uh, secondly, on September 21st and 22nd, which is two weeks, uh, we will be doing the seminar here on the diversities of tongues. We'll be talking about that in depth. One of the things that uh, God has really used JGLM for was to bring an emphasis back upon the Spirit of God in the sense of the baptism of the Spirit, speaking other tongues in these areas. Uh, if you may know anything about Dr. Lake, he actually made a statement one time that tongues was the making of his ministry. And so when you look at the scope of ministry he had, that is obviously a pretty big deal. And so we're going to be looking at these things even today. We're going to come into it a little bit. But on the 21st and 22nd, that's a Friday and Saturday. Uh, the Friday, we will be here from 7 to 9 approximately. And then Saturday will be a normal 9 to noon, 2 to 5 and then again that night at 7, we're going to have a special service also. So uh, that will be on the diversities of tongues. It'll, it we'll be talking about the baptism of the Spirit. We'll be talking about tongues, interpretation, uh, tongues and in intercession, edification, all the aspects of tongues. So it's going to be, uh, I'm really excited about it. So uh, even in some of the studies as I've been putting this together, I can definitely sense the direction that the Spirit of God is wanting to take this. So I'm, I'm really excited about this seminar. Then we will be in September 27th and 29th, through the 29th, we will be in Bakersfield, California, and we're going to be doing a new man training there, and then apparently right after that, October 4th, 5th, and 6th, we will be doing a new man in San Diego. So then if you go on our website, you can see all of these dates, it's on our schedule, but then October 18th through the 20th, we'll also be doing a SWAT training here, which is our spiritual warfare. And we're actually going to be combining SWAT 1 and SWAT 2 together so that you can actually see the kind of the whole picture of it. And then that'll be normal DHT hours, if you know what I mean. That's a Thursday through uh, Saturday, 9 to noon, 2 to 5. And then Saturday will be a 7 p.m. service also. Uh, also, we have our healing rooms open. They are open every day, Monday, well, every day, Monday through Friday, uh, roughly 10 to 4 p.m., 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And then also on Saturday or Sunday. Sunday, usually, most people aren't coming to the healing rooms. They just get ministered to here at the church. But Saturday, if a person needs to, they can contact us, and we will meet them here and pray with them uh, if that is when they can get here. So also we have, actually, that's enough announcements. So we're good. So, yes. <clears throat> Let me ask, um, and, and I don't always ask people to raise their hand, that kind of stuff, because... I know whenever I was sitting in the pew the majority of the time and they would always ask questions or they would ask people to do certain things and different things, you know, who's guest, who's visitors, first time, all that kind of stuff. And we really don't do that, but I wanted to, since we are talking about tongues and the baptism of the Spirit, I'm just curious, how many of you have spoken in other tongues? Let me see your hands. 
Okay, good, good deal. All right, so this won't be totally new to the majority of you, so that's good. Well, we're going to look at that today, and so we're going to go into this a little bit more, and then we're going to be, possibly, if we have enough time toward the end, we will take some questions and things, which, as always, we have a basket over here with index cards that if you have questions, you can always grab some of those and fill out the questions and bring them up. And a lot of times we'll have a break in between a couple of the sessions and you can bring those up and we'll be glad to either answer them if we can or, or talk to you about them, whatever we need to do. So we want to make sure that this is not just a preaching, but you're actually getting ministered to and getting your questions answered. So there's a lot of these things. Also in the back of the chair in front of you, you will find a card that I don't have. I had one, ah, there it is. You will find a card similar to this. And it is a ministry card. So if you want me to minister to you today, if you want me to, to pray for, for you, pray with you, lay hands on you, whatever we need to do, please fill one of these out and hang on to it and then bring it to me whenever I call for people to be ministered to and bring it up and we will be glad to pray for you. So those are in the back of your chair. Also, you will also find one of these, which is our partner form. You can go through that. Just tells about being a partner with us, but you should find one of these, which is our what we believe statement. Just gives you an idea. If you have questions about what we believe, that'll give you a good idea to go through it. It also makes a good Bible study because all the points are there and the scriptures are with it, so it's a good, uh, good point to study. <clears throat> also, starting in January, we will have our Dominion Bible Institute going on here. As a matter of fact, I will, if I get a chance, I'm going to read a section to you out of a letter that John Lake actually wrote uh, back in 1927, and he was talking about it. He said, if I had one thing to do to help the body of Christ, it would be to start a Bible school. And he was in the process of doing that. He actually started in 1934, but then passed away before they actually got it kind of up and running. Well, we have continued that on. We are doing our Bible school. We've already had our first year online. And so we will be doing our second year live here at the church, at the facility here. Uh, January, February, and March, it's three months. So those of you that are here or those of you that are watching by internet, if you can get here, it will be live and on site here. So if you need more information, you can actually pick up one of these, which is on the very back table right under the DBI banner. You can see, see that and give you a good idea of what we're doing. Make sure everything's there. Yep. Good, good. Okay, pick one of those up, read it, and then you can uh, talk to somebody here about uh, actually participating in that. So, all right, a couple of things. Let me see here. How's everybody doing? Everybody good this morning? All right, you woke up breathing. That's better than some. Amen? If you're going to wake up breathing, and you're going to be alive, then you should be alive. Amen? Don't just breathe, be alive. It's, you know the old saying, wherever you are, be there. Well, it's the same thing. If you're alive, be alive, right? Worst thing in the world, worst advertisement for Jesus Christ is the dead church. Amen. Isn't that right? And I'm not talking about just a local fellowship. I'm talking about the body of Christ. So we're going to look at some things. First off, this morning, I'm going to give you a couple of things here. Uh, <clears throat> and, and first, if you're taking notes, and, and I would always advise anybody coming here, always bring pen and paper if you can, always bring a Bible because we will be in Scripture and you can take some notes and follow along. Eventually we will start having these printed out for you that you can actually follow along with them. But we're going to give you some things today and, and actually if I was going to title this message it would be Why Tongues? Why Tongues? You know there's two things that the devil and those that are aligned with him, whether they be religious or not, uh, have fought the hardest and that is number one, healing and number two, tongues. Right? And third would be kingdom finances or you know, prosperity to some degree in some area. <clears throat> now, in the, we, we have pretty well destroyed most of the uh, sacred cows concerning healing. We have actually been used by God to push into the forefront uh, the truths of the Bible about healing and about how to receive healing and, and how to minister healing more than anything else. And so in the process of that, we've also noticed that the enemy also works against tongues. Well, it's kind of funny how he always likes to work against the things that God has promised you to be, uh, promised to you, and that are usually the biggest blessing to you. 
And so we want to talk about this today. We want to talk about why tongues. So I'm going to give you several things, actually about five or six little notes here. <clears throat> Number one, so if, I was, if someone said, why tongues? Why, why do you want to, why should we speak in other tongues? Why should we talk about tongues? Why are we even dealing with this? I'm going to give you at least six reasons right now, right? So if you have a pen and paper, make a note. Number one. Number one is that tongues are a sign. They're a sign. Jesus said that a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And then he said these signs will follow the believers. So he is telling us to give this wicked and adulterous generation a sign. And the sign, one of the signs we're supposed to use is tongues. Now, people say, well, but, you know, unbelievers, they don't understand tongues. That's right. Generally, they won't. But the idea is that it is a tongue, and we're going to talk about some of the details of this uh, in some of the future uh, sessions. But there are degrees in tongues that there are times when it is tongue, tongues of men, sometimes tongues of angels. You see it in the book of Acts, in Acts 2. It was actually the tongues of men that they could actually hear them speaking in their own language, and the apostles had learned uh, or had gained languages that they had never learned, put it that way. And so these men knew that it was some type of supernatural thing because these were, as I said, ignorant and unlearned men. And yet here they were speaking in all these different languages. Now, here's the thing that I want you to think about. When Jesus died and then arose, he appeared to 500 at one time. But then if you look at the book of Acts, and you look at Acts chapter 2, and they were all in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, only 120 were there. Well, the 120, that's still better than the 12 he, he left here, or the 11 if you want to get down to it. So whenever he actually left, he had the 11 that were his main disciples, but he had shown himself to 500, and apparently he told everybody, go to the upper room, go and wait until you receive the promise of the Father, which was the baptism of the Spirit, and they, they, there was a particular way that they would know that they had actually received this promise, and one of the ways they would know would be by these speaking in other tongues, and we're going to look at some of that today and how they knew that. But the thing is, out of 500 people, only 120 were able to wait the full 40 days, roughly 50 days from Jesus' resurrection. It only took 40 days for the vast majority of them to fall away, or at least not be there and not be waiting. But had they waited, and who knows how many were there? The upper room, uh, it was a large place. The Bible says it was, it was a large place. I'm assuming Jesus knew how many were going to be there, so I'm assuming that he... Uh, knew that it was a large enough place to hold the number of people that were there. But he, by the time the day of Pentecost was fully come, only 120 were left. And out of that 120, of course, were the 11 and Mary. And we know that Jesus' family was there. So there was groups there. But it's just amazing how many fell away. How, I wonder how many were there on day 35. How many were they on, there on day 37? But for whatever reason, little by little, they started dropping off so that by day 50, whenever the day of Pentecost was come, there was only 120 left. You know, you wonder, well, if it hadn't come till, uh, you know, three months later, would there have been anybody left? Well, there's an aspect on this, where we're talking about tongues and we're talking about the baptism of the Spirit and we're talking about this, a Spirit-filled church that... I'm, I really want to get over there as quickly as I can because I want to show you something even John Lake saw back in 1927. And if anything, we've seen it more now. And I really want us to get there. I really want us to see this today because I want you to be looking at your own life and be, as they would say, examine ourselves and make sure whether we be in the faith. So, first off, number one, it is a sign. Mark 16, verse 15 says... And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Now, whether you like it or whether you don't, there it is, right? Now, some people have said, well, yeah, but that's Mark 16. In Mark 16, there's some controversy over whether or not it, is, it was in the original text. Well, I got news for you. All the early apostolic fathers, the disciples, both the disciples of Jesus himself and the disciples of the disciples, all quoted Mark 16. 
every one of them quoted it, showing that it was in the Bible that they read. So if the first and second generation quoted it, then it's good enough for us. Amen? And so, first off, he says, These signs shall follow them that believe. So if you're a believer, you should be speaking in new tongues. That, that means a tongue. I know the group I was in originally, they would say, well, new tongues means, you know, used to if you were uh, in the world and before you got saved, you know, you, you probably cussed and said all kinds of stuff. But whenever you got saved, you quit doing that. So you got a new tongue, all right? That is not the new tongues that it's talking about, all right? Now, that should be true, but that's not what they're talking about. And then he goes on and says in verse 18, They shall take up serpents, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Notice laying hands on the sick is right there in the same passage with speaking in new tongues. So if you're going to lay hands on the sick, if you, if you believe that's a, a viable, biblical doctrine for today, then you should also be speaking in new tongues. If you're going to do one, you just don't get to pick and choose. All right? Now, number two, number one was it's a sign. Number two is it is direct communication between you and God. Now, one of, the, one of the situations that the church is in today, we have a, and William Booth actually said this at one point, he said that he saw, he foresaw that in the next generation, the next century after him, which he was mainly referring to the 1900s and coming into the, to uh, now, beginning of the 1900s, now to, into the year 2000, he said that he was, real concerned that Christianity would be a religion without Christ. That it would be a supposedly a spiritual endeavor without the spirit of Christ. And that out of all these things, in other words, what he was saying is, I'm afraid we're going to end up with a form, but not the actual functioning of the spirit. And we can see that over and over again. And here's one of the things, and I'm kind of interjecting this in here. You need to realize that the standard human trait is that if you don't rise to the level of, of any certain standard over a period of time, you will grow weary in trying to rise to it, and you will generally bring the standard down to your level of experience rather than rising your experience to the level of the standard. And we can see that. You see people who struggle against sin on and on and on and just keep struggling and never beat it. And usually when that happens, they end up lowering the standard of sin and saying, oh, well, they say one of two things. Either that's not sin anymore or it doesn't matter. And I can tell you, sin always matters. It mattered enough to cost Jesus his life, and it always matters. And so, but people have this, this tendency to bring the standard down. One of the things that I see in the church world now as I travel is I see a lot of people doing a whole lot of things and they would say it's by the Spirit, but most of the time it's nothing more than what human energy could produce. And many times it's just excitement. It's just a, uh, an emotional thing rather than the real thing. And that's what John Lake actually referred to in his letter that I'll read to you here in a few minutes. But it's just amazing to me that, and this is one of the reasons why, when people read John Lake's material, the one thing I know what it did with me and I, what I hear over and over again from people is, there was something different about what he wrote. And especially if you compare it to what people write today. There is a depth in his writings that came from experience. And one of the main things, and if you've been through our Divine Healing Technician training, we even read a letter there, and he said that the secret was that he taught his workers that when they received the baptism of the Spirit, they received the power of God. And so many times... I think we have just negated the actual depth of the Spirit of God in meetings. Now, I'm not talking about getting so far off into one ditch that you don't even mention Scripture and it's all by the Spirit, supposedly, or you get off in the other ditch where everything is so legalistic and so formal and so much just, you know, by the letter that you end up being legalistic and killing people, right, and just bashing people over the head with Scripture. I'm not talking about either ditch. I'm talking about the Spirit and the Word working together in balance and, and actually bringing a depth that very honestly as I travel around I just don't see in the body of Christ and then when I read 
letters and even some of the sermons of Dr. Lake and some of the early Pentecostal pioneers, they had such a depth that it literally, there have been times in my own life where I just yearned for that. And I said, man, why don't we have that? Why don't we see that anymore? You know, and, and very usually whenever I say that, I have to turn right back to myself and say, why isn't that in me the way that it was in them? You know, what is different? And one of the things that I heard, well, I say heard, I read <laughs> that Dr. Lake said that really surprised me, he talked about a woman main, named Miss Emma Wick who was his secretary at one time. And he said she had a real knack for getting people to speak in tongues without the baptism of the Spirit. Now, think about that. I know that when I first read that, I thought, whoa, that's, uh, that is totally contrary to, I didn't think that was possible. But then he explained some things, and, it will, and we will be talking about these. That's why I'm saying there needs to be a depth. It's not just a matter of receiving. It's not just a matter of, well, I spoke in tongues once, and that's all that counts, so you know, that, that's good enough. No, this should be a daily occurrence. Paul said, I, I speak in tongues more than you all. You know, which also proves he was Southern, as I always say, because nobody uses the words y'all except Southerners. So, but that's what, the way he spoke. So I believe firmly that there is supposed to be an ongoing relationship with the Spirit that increasingly takes you into the greater depths of the Spirit. Amen? And that's what we want. We don't want to just have this, and, and that's what I always tell everybody, you know, we have this theology today that's usually an inch deep and a mile wide. And it should be a mile wide and a mile deep. Amen? We should delve into the things of the Spirit. So, we want to talk about this. So, number two, it is direct communication between you and God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, it says, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understands him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. You get that? No man understands him. And it, that's the whole idea of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is Paul is talking about the difference between uh, prophecy or prophesying and speaking in other tongues. And he's talking about predominantly in a church setting or in an assembly setting. And he talks about the depths of the Spirit of God. <clears throat> and he talks about how when you speak in other tongues, you're not speaking to men, but unto God. And that it is the Spirit of God in you motivating that speech, and, and again, we'll, we'll look at this a little bit deeper, but know this, number one, it is direct communication between you and God. Now, those of you that have not been baptized in the Spirit, have not received the Spirit, have not spoken other tongues, what we want to happen today is I want to give you that desire to ask God for it, and he said if you ask, he will give you the Holy Spirit. So, he will give you the Holy Spirit, and you can and should speak in other tongues. So, Number two, it is a direct communication between you and God. Number three, and this is always a fun one, it confounds the wise. Right? It confounds the wise. God always chose the foolish things to confound the wise. People say, well, that just sounds like gibberish. Well, you know, you would say the same thing about a foreign language if I took you into somewhere in Africa and took you into a particular area or into India or into South America or in anywhere, I can take you somewhere where there is a dialect that sounds like gibberish. It does not sound like a language, but to the people speaking it and the people that understand it, it is clear communication, and if you don't speak it, guess what? You're the ignorant one. All right, is that blunt enough for you? It's not that, that the people that speak that language are ignorant because it sounds strange. It only sounds strange to you. But once you learn that language, it no longer sounds strange. Now it makes sense to you, right? That's one of our problems. Is the things we don't understand, we automatically push out and say, well, that doesn't make sense, so it must not be true. And I know that many think that they are the sum total of all wisdom, and therefore, if it doesn't make sense, it must not be sensible. But the fact is, the Spirit of God knows more than you do. Amen? And so because of that, He knows, and whenever He, he can cause... I, I love what Dr. Summerall said one time when we were up there. He said, people talk about tongues... And they say it doesn't make sense and call it gibberish and they call it all these different words. And he said, and the fact is, you can go anywhere in this world and somebody can say one sound. And if you go over there, you may not even know the language, but you can make a sound and somewhere that sound is a word to somebody. He said, there is not a sound you can make that is not a word somewhere to somebody. And all you'd have to do is find out where they speak that and you would already have one word in their language. 
And he said, so whenever you sit and say that the speaking in tongues or may, is just a, a gibberish and it doesn't make any sense, he says it shows your ignorance, not their ignorance. And so I've always remembered that, that, that many times, and we're going to look at this even today because Isaiah prophesied this. And so many people say, well, my language, yeah, I don't really, when I pray in tongues, it doesn't really sound like a language. That's okay. We're going to cover that today. And, and I will show you exactly what to do to allow God to grow that within you. So, number three, it confounds the wise. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 23, he says, If therefore the whole church be come together in one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, Will they not say you are mad? Well, now notice he's saying if you're all there and all you do is speak in tongues and somebody comes in and they don't understand it, they're going to think you're crazy. They're going to think you're mad and because they don't understand it. Right? Now, he didn't say it was wrong to do. And he didn't say don't do it because they won't understand it. He just said they won't understand it. So what does it do? It confounds even the wise in the world. Number four. Going through these kind of quick here. Number four. It requires faith. Speaking in tongues requires faith. That's one of the primary reasons why you can prove it's of God. Because anything that's going to please God is going to require faith. And any time, and listen carefully, any time you decide to use your faith, you are pleasing God. You get that? Because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. When you use faith, it pleases Him. So if it requires faith for you to speak in tongues, and it does, and even after you receive the Spirit, and even after you've spoken in tongues before, every time you open your mouth to speak in tongues, it requires faith. And because of that, at that moment, you are pleasing God. So if there was no other reason to speak in tongues than that alone, that's enough. Amen? I, I'm, I'm, it's amazing to me the number of people that doing good is not its own reward enough for them. In other words, you should do things because it's right, not because of what you're going to get back from it. And the fact that you're doing it because it's right, that should be enough reward in that in itself. In other words, if you can do something to please God, then that should be enough right there and because God said it. And again, it's, it's kind of like Mark 11, 22 and 23 and 24. You know, half the people in the charismatic world think Kenneth Hagin wrote that. Because that's, you know, he's taught on it so much. But the fact is, Jesus said it. A lot of people don't like it. People don't like the fact that Jesus said, you can have what you say. Matter of fact, he even went further than that and said, you will have what you say. Now, but people don't like that. And the reason they don't like it is because they don't like to watch what they say. They don't like to tame their tongue. And so they'd rather just discount the whole thing and say, oh, that's, that's excess or that's wrong. No, are there excesses in it? Sure. Is there wrong in it? Sure, like everything else. But still, regardless of whether we like it or whether we don't, Jesus said it. Well, by the same token, he said in Mark 16 that if you believe on him, you will speak in other tongues. So if there was no other reason, that's enough, right? Just being obedient and following in him. Now, again, usually what happens is if people maybe have sought that before and not received it, then eventually they will push it off and say, well, it must not be important. No, it is important. And anything that you ask for and you're not seeing the benefit of, usually it's because it is so important and the devil is fighting tooth and nail to keep you from getting it. So in that case, if it's a clear promise from God, you ought to push right on through and say, nope, I'm not moving till I get it. Why? Because it was promised to me. Jesus said, I need to speak in other tongues. Well, why? Well, I don't know yet. Brother Curry hadn't got that far, but eventually we will, all right? But regardless, you should still get it. Amen? Now, <clears throat> look at the next one. Okay, so what do we got? It's a sign. It is direct communication between you and God. It confounds the wise. And the number four, it requires faith. Number five, it is a rest and a refreshing. Right? So we're going to look at this one for a minute. If you go to Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28. We're going to start in verse 9. And there he says... Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. Verse 10. 
for precept, and that word in the Hebrew, precept, is the Hebrew word which means commandment or an, or an injunction. For precept, commandment, injunction, must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Now what he's saying is, listen, you don't get it all in one sitting. He brings it piece by piece, like building a foundation in a house. You have to lay the bricks, put in the mortar before you can lay another line of brick. And so it is built up, and that is how the house is built, is line upon line, layer upon layer. You don't understand it all at one time. If you try to understand it all at one time, or let me say it this way, if you wait until you think you understand it all, before you start moving in the things of God, you will never do a thing. I, there are people where I started in the church I started that were there 30 years ago, and they were waiting for God to open doors in their own words, or they're waiting for this thing or that thing, or waiting for a sign of some sort. And it's funny because whenever they would say those kind of things, I used to tell them, what, the doors are open, just go push on them. How do you even know they're shut? How do you even know they're locked? Just go push on the door, you know, step out. And the funny thing is, I've been around the world a dozen times now, and some of those people are still sitting there waiting for God to show them where to go. Well, it's pretty, pretty easy. Go anywhere in the world. We're, we are commanded to go into all the world. So anywhere you go, you're not going to be wrong. Amen? And that's what we've done. We've gone around the world, and every time I'd go around the world, I'd come back, go visit that church. And guess what? People still sitting there waiting on God. And I would tell them, you know what? You want to you see God move? Come go with me. Travel with me. Why? Because God is... We are not waiting on God. God is waiting on us. Right? So, number five, it is a rest and a refreshing. Isaiah 28, and notice here, look at verse 11. Isaiah 28, 11. It says, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. And notice, first off here, he is referring to the Hebrew people, of course. But he is referring here, now there's two things, stammering lips and another tongue. Now this was to be a sign, and we're going to look at the purpose of it here, but notice first off, most people, some people say, well, you know, my, my, my tongue doesn't sound like a language. It doesn't, it, it just, you know, if it was a language, it'd be baby talk, you know. Okay, that's good enough. You're still scripture, because he said with stammering lips. He didn't say with clear fluency, right, which is obviously what God wants you to move in. But he says with stammering lips. In most people's tongues, because there is such a lack of teaching in the church on tongues, and really there's only a couple of ministries that I even know of that even deal with tongues to any, any degree at all. And whenever you look at this, most people's tongues, if they do not develop it, in other words, if they do not move into it, if they don't practice it regularly, if it's not a common part of their life, they will be still in stammering lips. And, and then when, that's the cases when their tongues is not fluent, it doesn't flow, it doesn't sound like a language, but it sounds like someone, as we would say in modern language, stuttering. It's almost the same thing, where it sounds like the same word over and over. Many uh, Pentecostal churches that I've been in, you hear people pray in tongues, and it just sounds like they're just stuttering, literally. I'm not making fun of it, that's just the level of their speech towards God. That's, and usually what that shows is they have not spent very much time speaking in other tongues. Usually it's because all they do, the only speaking in tongues they do is when they're in church. And if that's all you do, like anything else, you're not going to be very good at it because you cannot get that much practice in an hour on Sunday. And especially if usually most what's done in the church is you sit and don't do anything. Because then you're not even practicing it there. And usually the only practice in tongues you get in churches is roughly, you know, 20 minutes maybe uh, during the worship time. Well, we're not going to do that here. We're going we're to be practicing this. We're going to be getting this to develop in you on purpose. We, I, I, I have never intended for this to be church as usual. I intended, matter of fact, when we were talking about the names of the church, we were even looking at calling it World Outreach Training Center because the idea is that we want to train believers not just teach and not just share, but actually get you activated to actually move into these things. So that's what we're going to be doing. Now, let's look at the next part. He says in verse 11, For the st with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Verse 12, To whom he said, Now this is, remember, he's still talking about tongues. This is the rest 
wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. Now notice, they did not receive it. The Jews did not receive it when it was first brought to them. It was passed over. But then we have accepted it. So we will hear this even though they won't hear it, right? We have heard it, we have received it, we believe it, we agree with it. And because of that, now notice, here's the number one reason. It is a rest and a refreshing. Praying in other tongues. He told us, Peter told us to, to not grow weary in well-doing, but to continue doing. Because usually when people grow weary in well-doing, it's just before they get their breakthrough. It's just before they actually have their miracle, and they quit just before they get to what they're trying to get to. That's why I said, how many people went to wait for the promise of the Father in the upper room, but fell away little by little? Why? Because they grew weary in well-doing and ended up with only 120 there. So, speaking in other tongues is a rest and a refreshing. Notice, he says, let's read this here. In verse 12, he says, To whom he said, This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. What is the refreshing? Speaking with stammering lips in another tongue. That is the refreshing. It came with the, the Spirit. So as you pray in other tongues, it, when the, one of the best times to pray in other tongues, it's funny because usually the things you need to do, you need to do them when you don't feel like doing them, which is one of the proofs you need to do them. Right? And so whenever you get tired, whenever you get ready to give up, whenever you get, you know, it just doesn't seem like it's working, Whenever you just, you know, I just, I just don't see the use of getting up and, and you know, making confession. And, and when I say confession, I'm talking about confessing the Word of God. I'm not talking about confessing sins and stuff. That should be automatically taken care of. You should automatically do that. But whenever you, you start confessing what the Word of God says about you, and then you get tired and, well, you know, I just don't see any change. Well, that's like a farmer planting seed and then going out every day for the first two weeks and going, well, I don't see anything. I'm just not going to go back out to the field again. No, there's a time of harvest. There's a time when you plant the seed of the Word of God and you're confessing the Word of God, and there's a time between the time you plant and the time you see it and you start to harvest it. And it's during that time that we always call the mean time, you know, between the time you pray and the time you receive, and we always say that's the mean time. That's, that, that's the time that's mean. That's when it's rough on you, you know what I mean by mean. And so that is whenever, that's the mean time. So you, there's that time. That, if you're going to grow weary in well-doing, that's when it's going to be. You know, whenever you have people, I, I, I talk with people at times, they say, well, you know, I've been believing for my healing for this long a time and for this going on, you know, and I'm just tired and I just don't sit. Well, if you see it, you don't need faith. Faith is for what you don't see. Now, anybody can have faith, or I should say, anybody can believe it when they see it. I mean, it, once you, you know, I, I've said things before, we've, we've made things or said things about what we we're going to do. Uh, when we first started, I said, we're going to have a Bible school. We're going to be doing this thing. And there were people that I told that to that didn't believe it. They said, how could that ever be? How, how could that be? You know, look at us. We don't have anything. We don't have anything we need. You know, starting the church here, you know, one of the first things. Well, we don't have a worship team. Well, too bad. You know, neither did Jesus. Right? Jesus didn't use any one of these things up here except maybe some drums, some of that might, might be it. Right? And we don't have any record of any of that. As a matter of fact, one of the things that I'm, I'm convinced is that in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be teaching on worship. And I'm, I'm really glad we don't have a worship team yet. I, I know that sounds strange, but I really am. Because if it was a worship team, it has a tendency to go toward performance and entertainment. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you about worship. We're going to get you to worshiping without any of this stuff, where you're truly worshiping in spirit and in truth. It doesn't say spirit, truth, and music, right? Not against music. Just saying, you don't need it. If, in most churches, if the electricity went out, they couldn't do worship. Because most of it, it there, exactly, yeah. Okay, you can hear it in the background, okay? So, but that's, that's most churches. And that is, Jesus never required that. You ought to be able to worship anywhere. If you have to have, you know, a six-piece band behind you, and electronics and electrical power to do all that kind of stuff, you would be useless in somewhere in Africa, somewhere in the Amazon or somewhere in India. Why? Because you have to bring it with you and you have to have it inside of you to be able to worship God anywhere you are. And that's one of the things that tongues does is that it brings out that worship and it, and it propels you toward worship.
right? So when you start talking about these things, and like I said, we're going we're to teach you on worship. We're going to get you moving in worship without that. And I firmly believe as soon as we get you worshiping without it to where that's no longer a concern, then God can bring it in. And the people will show up that have the talents and skills and all that that needs to do it. Until then, honestly, I'm not worried about it. Because if you come here for a show, you're coming for the wrong reason anyway. Amen? We're coming here to be trained so we can go out and change our world. That's the key. Now, he says here, notice, as I, as I was talking earlier, the, there is this, um, there's a time when you can grow weary. You can keep on going, keep on going, and, and eventually you just get, kind of get tired and you just get, kind of get wore out, you might say. And usually people that get weary in well-doing, they are not speaking in other tongues very often. As you begin to pray in other tongues and speak in other tongues, it starts to lift you again. And you can start to go, go down, you start praying in tongues, build you up again. And it just, it helps carry you on. And, and again, a lot of these things we're having to lay precept upon precept, line upon line, that we'll be able to get deeper and deeper as we go along with this. So the, the number five reason here to speak in other tongues and be, and be praying in other tongues is because it gives you a rest. It gives you a refreshing Praying in tongues refreshes you, right? It will refresh you. So many times I hear churches talk about, oh, well, we're, we're looking for a time of refreshing. We're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come refresh us. Right there he says, you want refreshing? Pray in tongues. If you pray in tongues, you will be refreshed. It, he didn't say, wait until you're refreshed. He said, this is the refreshing. Praying in tongues is the refreshing. You want a refreshing? You want a time of God moving freely in your midst? Begin praying in other tongues. And as we move into this, you watch. We're going to have times and, and services that are geared toward that. Even at the uh, seminar we're going to be doing in a couple of weeks, the Saturday night uh, service is not going to be a healing service, even though there will be healing taking place. But the primary purpose of the Saturday night is it is going to be a Holy Spirit service, and the predominant aspect of it is going to be praying in other tongues, speaking in other tongues, tongues of interpretation, tongues of intercession. I expect everything that I'm going to be teaching uh, during those two days to be culminated on that night and taking place in that night so that you should see everything that we'll be teaching about taking place that night. And so all of that, that, that I'm really expecting that session to be a breakthrough moment even for this congregation but also for everybody that attends because there is an aspect of moving through. There is praying in tongues that is you doing it. And what I mean by that is you can stop anytime you want and it's almost like a push to do it. But then there comes a point after praying in tongues that all of a sudden it's a breaking through the flesh. And then at that point it's easier to continue praying in tongues than it is to stop. And it just starts carrying on. And if you're, I don't want to use the right words, but Many times, it's easier, you'll just be going along not thinking about anything, and tongues just burst out, you know, while you're driving down the road, you know, thinking about something else, and all of a sudden, tongues are just burst out. And other times, and, and there's aspects of this that we'll be talking about, there is praying with tongues, which is called praying in the Spirit, and then there's praying with your understanding. Now, the very, and again, we can look at these scriptures, but the very fact that it says praying in the Spirit and Paul said, I will pray with my spirit and I will pray with my understanding proves that whenever you pray with the spirit in other tongues, you do not understand what you're saying. Because if it was, then you'd be praying with the understanding. So then you have to pray. And it says if you, if you pray in other tongues, also pray that you can interpret. So you should be interpreting your tongues, right? That's not just for church services. It is in your private life. Oral Roberts built ORU based on praying in other tongues and interpreting it, right? Now, I don't usually throw people out there because sometimes they're controversial or whatever, but it's a fact. The same thing with John Lake. Almost every sermon that you read of his was first prayed in tongues, and then he interpreted it, made notes, and then preached it. Almost every one of them. So that's where the flow of the Spirit was and why he said that tongues was the making of his ministry. So there is praying with the understanding. There is praying with the Spirit. Then he also said, I will sing with the understanding, and I will sing with the Spirit. So then that means singing in other tongues. There is a time for singing in other tongues. Again, we're going to go over a lot of this in the uh, tongues conference that we'll be doing here, uh, or tongues seminar here in a couple of weeks. And you'll, we'll get a lot more in-depth, and it's not limited to roughly an hour or so. So <clears throat> he said this is the rest, 
And this is the refreshing. You want to be refreshed? Pray in other tongues. You know, you just, you're going, you get busy. I'll tell you, a good time to pray in tongues. Well, all, every, all the time is a good time to pray, right? There's never really a, a wrong time necessarily. But a good time to pray in tongues, especially you'll see it. We're coming up on it, the Christmas holidays, that kind of stuff. You get tired, you get weary, you're doing all this stuff. You get all, did I get to do all this? Now I'm running around and you're thinking all these things. Just stop, start praying in tongues and watch. You'll get refreshed rejuvenated. Some people say, what's well, like getting my second wind? Exactly. Second wind of the Spirit. Set the pneuma, right? You're getting your second pneuma, right? Why? Because it is a refreshing. It is a rest. It brings peace. It shakes all the garbage off of you during the day. And so you can actually stay focused. And praying in tongues, again, I, I can't emphasize enough. If you don't, you should. Okay? And I will tell you two things. Number one, you're never too young, never too old. Amen? Never too young, never too old. Uh, we were talking about this uh, yesterday, I guess it was, or the other day. Back in the early 1900s, I think it was before 1914, right around then, in Armenia, there was a group of Pentecostal believers, and they began praying in other tongues, as they know, would normally do, but their children, as young as six and seven years old, were speaking in other tongues, having dreams and visions, and, and bring in these tongues, and as they would pray, even these children would begin to, to speak in other tongues, and then would start to interpret it, and they warned them about this invasion that was fixing to happen, and as they started hearing about this, the people actually, now listen, you get to think about this, here's a group of people, the children are praying in tongues, and begin to, to interpret it, and as they interpret it, they said there's going to be an invasion and this army is going to come in and kill a lot of people. And these adults, the, the adult Pentecostals there, so believed that it was the Spirit of God in these children speaking that they actually picked up, packed up their belongings, moved into an area that was not uh, inhabited, more out in the wilderness a little bit. And whenever this army did invade within just a couple of months after that, the, this army almost totally wiped out all of the civilian populace in Armenia and about the only people that were left were the Pentecostal Christians that basically hid in the hills. And it was all because children at six and seven and eight years old prophesied it through tongues and interpretation. And, and I can give you, I've got lots of stories in my own life, lots of stories with my mom early on, different things that we saw, tongues, interpretation, praying in the spirit, being led by the spirit to pray for people in intercession. We're going to talk about all these things. So it's going to take some time to work through them, but eventually we will get to them. Now, <clears throat> look at number six. We had number five. It's a rest and a refreshing. And point number six is very simply this. God chose it. All right? Now, that should be number one and number six. All right? God chose it. God was one that decided to use tongues as a sign. We don't always understand every reason that God has for doing something. But that's where faith in God comes in, that we have faith in Him. If we have faith in God, then we know that He is our Heavenly Father and that if He has commanded us to do something, it is for our benefit as well as for the outcome of the thing commanded. Right? Sometimes you just, if you're going to follow God, you just have to do what He said because He said to do it. And then later on you find out why He said to do it. You know? It's kind of like I was talking not too long ago and I told a person, I said, it's as if you're in the military, and if I yell duck, I don't have time to explain why you should duck. And if you wait for an explanation, you'll probably get killed. So when someone yells duck, you just do it, and you find out later why you did it. Right? But most people don't have that concept. Well, God said, speak in tongues. That's what he said. So we should do it. Simple as that. Amen? Now... The language of heaven, and I hesitate saying this because it's going to open up a whole bunch of stuff here, and I don't have time for it today. But the language of heaven is knowing. Okay? The language of heaven is knowing. But the communication of the Spirit is in tongues. Okay? The language of heaven. Most of the people that have testimonies of going to heaven, most of them in their testimonies, they knew they would have conversations with people without talking. 
In other words, they knew what the other person was saying. People would say, well, that's like mental telepathy. Yes, in a, in a, you know, in a way it is, but it's just you know. Why? Because if you were of the same spirit and you both had the same spirit, then there should be no difference in communication, and it's just ongoing, kind of like you talking to yourself, but you already know what you're going to say. Right? Why? Because it's the same spirit in both of you. So that's, now that is in heaven, but the communication of the spirit is through tongues. Right? And speaking in tongues is almost as we'd say, like fiber optics, in the sense that it goes both ways, information travels both ways at the same time. It says that while you, while you pray in tongues, you are talking not to men but to God. But then he also said, pray that you may interpret. So it's not just a matter of you talking to God. And every time we read about this in the book of Acts, it talks about them magnifying God, praising God, worshiping God, and magnifying God. So the tongues that you speak magnify God, but at the same time, you can't magnify God except that that same power works in you to encourage you, to build you up, and builds into you by the Spirit of God. If you are magnifying God, the, the, the power that you're using to magnify Him is actually at the same time building up your spirit. Right? Again, we'll talk about this a little bit more a little bit later on. Go with me. If you have your Bibles, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to read a couple of things to you that you may not be used to, and you may have not have seen them this way, but I want you to think about it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I want to read it qu quickly. We've read this before in the DHT. Verse 1, Paul says, And I, brethren, remember he's writing to the Corinthians, and they were messed up and carnal and all kinds of stuff. They were not a spiritual church, right? And yet they, it's the only group that he ever explained the gifts of the Spirit to. Right? So it tells you something right there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Why? Verse 5. So that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom. And notice this word wisdom. Watch this. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Now in just a minute, if you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it says that if you speak to God, you're speaking to Him, you're speaking mysteries to God. So now think about this as tongues. Now watch what he says. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world under our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, and you'll notice here he's quoting out of Isaiah chapter 64, but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered in the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So there are things that God has prepared strictly for people that love him. Not for everybody, for people that love him. But God hath revealed them, these things, unto us by his Spirit. So how do you learn it? By the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. So now, you say, well, I thought the Spirit was God. That's true. But it's the Spirit that works in between God and us and connects us to God. And the things that we can learn of God, we get by the Spirit. We don't bypass the Spirit. The Spirit brings these things to us, and the things that God has prepared for us, He brings to us by His Spirit. Now, verse 11. For what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, so that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, he also goes on to say, But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. 
neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Now, I am absolutely convinced that this particular passage of this scripture, Paul is referring, when he talks about talking about the things of the Spirit, getting the things by the Spirit, and speaking in wisdom that the Spirit teaches, I am absolutely convinced he is talking about speaking in other tongues and drawing out the wisdom of God and then interpreting it. And that's how, well, I really believe that that's a lot of how Paul wrote his letters to his you know, disciples, you might say. And I believe most of this, what he's talking about here, is referring to speaking in other tongues. Now, go with me to Romans chapter 8. You remember Paul wrote Romans 8 also. And look at verse 1. Now remember, we're talking about tongues. So let's remember looking at tongues and looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, bringing these things by the Spirit of God. We know the things of the Spirit by the Spirit that's in us, and we don't learn these by the wisdom which man teaches, but wisdom which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual with spiritual. So all these things, put this with Romans 8 now. Let's read verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And then he goes on, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, go down to verse 4, and I'm going to skip through this because I don't have time to read it all, but you can go back and read the whole chapter. But notice verse 4. So that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So now, again, he's talking about walking after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. How do you know if you're of the Spirit or of the flesh? What do you think about? Do you think about the things of the flesh? Do you think about the things of the Spirit? Does the, the flesh, does the world, does all the things in the world, is that where your head is all the time? Or is it on the things of the Spirit of God? But they that are after the Spirit, quote unquote, mind the things of the Spirit. Verse 6, for to be carnally minded, fleshly minded, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And then he says, because the carnal mind is enmity or at war against God, it's not subject to the law of God, neither, in can, neither indeed can be. Verse 8, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you're always thinking about the things of the flesh, walking in the flesh, acting like flesh, living like the world, talking like the world, living in the things of the world, you cannot please God. Why? Because the love of the Father is not in you if you love the things of the world. Verse 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. You see that? If the Spirit of God dwells in you, then you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And if the Spirit of God dwells in you, your mind is going to be on the things of the Spirit. Now, he says, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So you either are or you're not, right? And verse 10, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But it, now watch what he's talking about here again. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Remember, we're still talking about the Spirit, speaking in other tongues. He says that that spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. It's that spirit in you that is speaking in the tongues, right, out of your spirit. If that spirit's in you, and if it raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. How's he going to quicken your mortal body? By his spirit that dwelleth in you, not by the spirit that dwelleth in somebody else. Right? Let's just think about that. Remember, I'm trying to, I'm not saying we would not lay hands on people. We will. We'll lay hands on you. I'm saying God's desire is that you get things directly from him and you don't have to go to somebody else to get it. That's his desire. Now, in the meantime, if you're suffering, don't hold out, right? Get help, okay? Work toward getting it for yourself, but in the meantime, work together with the body. The body's here to minister to you, to help you, and sometimes you just need some help getting over the hump, so to speak. So it's always there, but God's desire is that he work through his spirit in you to bring healing. Now, his, his uh, healing and anything else that you need, but now his real desire is to not have to heal you, even by his spirit. His real desire is that you live in divine health, walk in divine health, 
And because of that, and the way you live in that divine health is you learn how to let the Spirit of God emanate from you so that sickness and disease can't even get to you. Right? Now, go down to verse 16. Remember talking about the Spirit of God that dwells in us? He's the one that speaks in these other tongues. It is His coming into us that brings the refreshing, brings the rest. The Spirit itself should say Himself, same difference. The Spirit Himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now go to verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. Now that word infirmities doesn't always mean sickness. It can mean any type of frailty. It can mean a problem. It can mean anything. It can be physically, emotionally, mentally, financially. It can be any area, right? Anywhere you have a lacking or a need, that's an infirmity. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. For we know not, look at that word knowing, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself, itself, makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And we're going to look at that word groanings, but not today. But I want you to realize, the Spirit, now notice, this is talking about the Spirit of God dwelling in you. You don't always know how to pray, and you don't know how to pray the right way, to pray the right prayers the right ways. And so when you don't know how to pray, then automatically the Spirit in you can pray correctly. But if He's going to pray correctly for you, He's going to pray through you. Right? So it is the Spirit of God energizing you inside to speak in other tongues. And that's why he says you don't speak to men, but you speak to God. And whenever you are, the Holy Spirit will make intercession for you, because you don't the infirmity you have may not be sickness. It may be you don't know which job to take. You don't know which contract to sign. You don't know certain things. And because of that, you can pray in other tongues. And as you pray in other tongues, that it is the Spirit of God praying through you, to intercede on your behalf. Do you realize that many times you're not interceded for because you won't pray in other tongues and let the Spirit work through you? You get that? He said, why isn't God doing something? He said, I'm waiting for you to let the Spirit pray through you. Why? Because there is an aspect on this earth where men have to ask to bring the things of heaven to, to this earth. That's why Jesus said, pray that His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you want to pray the perfect prayer, pray in tongues. It's the perfect prayer, right? Why? How do we know that? Okay, now notice, he will make intercession. It's the Spirit that makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. In other words, it's groanings inside. And it's talking about here that it's, it, you can't make these words right. It is the Spirit of God that makes the words. Okay? Now notice, verse 27, And he that searches the hearts, the Spirit of God, knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So as he speaks through you, it, it is you are giving the Spirit the ability to speak through you on your behalf and praying the perfect will of God and praying God's will for the saints, us, at that moment. Right? So from a strictly, and I hate to even say this, but unfortunately, this is what motivates some people, so I'm going to say it anyway, right? Strictly on a selfish level. If you don't pray in tongues for any other reason, you ought to pray just so God can do things for you, right? Again, I wish I didn't even have to say that, right? But if that's what motivates somebody, eventually you'll move out of that and move into the things of God. So, and we know, and why, now see, this is, you always hear this verse, but most people don't ever read it in context. In verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now notice there's a couple of things here. Number one, it says, and we know that all things work together. What things? The things that the Spirit of God is praying through you in tongues and intercession. In, as you pray in these other tongues, the Spirit of God is praying these things through you, and those are the things that he's praying that works together for your good. People say, well, you know, all things work together for the good. And it's as far as they go, you know, well, did you hear about so-and-so? They were in a car wreck. Like, well, you know, all things work together for the good. Now, they didn't say car wrecks work together for the good. It says all things work together for the good based on the Spirit of God making intercession for you by the Spirit with groanings that cannot be uttered. You get that? So all things don't work together. For, number two, all things don't work together for the good 
just for everybody. It says all things work together for the good to those who are the called according to his purpose, to those who love God, right? Now, so it's not always based on, you know, just everything that happens. Now, so you're getting this idea of the Spirit of God working through you. If I, if I can just get this across to you, this is the big thing. Oh, I'm losing stuff here. This is the big deal. I really want to get you to see. It is amazing how little the Bible talks about being born again. Right? It mentions it. It talks about it. Obviously, it's, it's the connection of God. It is important. But the amazingly over overwhelming evidence of the Bible, all of the disciples, Jesus, God, the Old Testament prophets, all of them talk more about the incoming of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit dwelling with us more so than it did the result of us being born again by that. You get that? So there was something, it's almost like, well, we really want this person to be here, but before they can be here, they have to be born. Okay, so being born is pretty important because they can't be here without being born. What's well, the same thing that, that's the way that Paul talked in Galatians. He says, because you're a son, he has sent the spirit of his, fa the spirit of his son into you, crying, Abba, Father. So, yeah, it's great that you're born again, but don't, don't just stop there. Be filled with the spirit. Why? Because the purpose of him coming was to give us the spirit. It was to bring the spirit of God into union with us. I'm going to read uh, something here in just a minute. I can find it here. I should have it right there. There it is. But I want you to realize, I think too often we, we minimize the interaction with the Spirit of God with us. And we don't realize that it is not, in, in the way we've looked at it, and even in the, in the training we've done before, we've tried to bring this out. Too many people today look at the Spirit of God the way we used to look at the old scuba diving tanks. Remember the scuba divers, they had the, the two tanks on the back, and you had to get the mixture perfect between the two, just right. And, but you always had two tanks. And they still look at that. Most people look at that today. Well, here, there's me, and there's the Holy Spirit. And I'm over here, and the Spirit's over here, like these two tanks of the scuba divers. And then they figured out, you know what? We could mix these two things and get a perfect mixture so nobody would have to mess with the mixture and it'd be perfect and we could just put it together in one tank. And so now you see the scuba divers instead of two tanks, they got one tank because the mixture is perfect and you don't have to mess with it. And yet in the church, we still talk about the church, we, we talk about the Spirit of God as separate from us. Whereas we have this element and that element. And I'm telling you, if you have this element and that element, if you have a person and then you have the Spirit of God, you still don't have a Christian. T.L. Osborne said, the Spirit of God in a person makes a Christian. So you don't have the Spirit of God and a Christian. You have the Spirit of God. He that joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. This was the, the, the revelation that John Lake had. And this is what the church still doesn't have. A hundred years later, they still don't get it. That it is, and, and even though it, well, I say a hundred years, two thousand years, because Paul said it first. He said that he just joined the Lord as one spirit of the Lord. But we still have this idea of, well, it's the spirit of God or me. You know, there's a spirit and then there's me. No, we are one. There is a union that God has brought us to where his spirit literally has permeated our spirit to where you cannot tell us apart. That's what it's supposed to be in our spirit. And as I've said before, the example I always use is I've told people, well, you know, they'll say, well, Brother Curry, how should we do this? What, what, what should I do in this? Well, all right, here's what you ought to do. Now, number one, you do this, and two, and you do there. And I just tell them. And then they stop and they say, now, okay, I, I can see that now. But when you said that, was that you or the Lord speaking? And I said, yes. And they look at me strange. And they no, you didn't understand, Brother Curry. Was that you or the Lord? I said, yes, it was. Why? Because if I speak by the Spirit, it was me and the Lord speaking. You understand? Why? Because we are one. Now, to the degree my mind is renewed to the Word of God and by the Spirit of God, that we can operate as one. Now, we're one whether I operate as one or not. We're still one. And that is the real tragedy, is you have people walking around with the Spirit of the living God. We're talking about the, the, the Spirit of God that created everything. 
People are walking around with Him, living in them, joined to them, in union with Him. Total access to all the wisdom of God, total access to all, literally all the power of God, and yet they're walking around like orphans. And yet Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. I'll not leave you comfortless. I will send another comfort. And he was with you, and he shall be in you. And you got these people walking around with this, the spirit of the living God in them. And they walk around acting like, well, what am I going to do? I don't know what I'm going to do. I, you know, we just can't pay our bills. We can't do this. And I don't know what to do. can't do that. And you, I, just, I just don't know where to turn. For a Christian to say that is a tragedy. A Christian should never have to say, I don't know. They, if anything, they ought to say, hang on just a second. Yeah, here's what you ought to do. Why? And they draw on the wisdom of God. But I'll tell you this, when you do that, it's going to be because you have spent so much time praying in other tongues. Why? Because praying in other tongues draws out the counsel of God and literally embeds it in you to be used whenever you need it. In other words, it's praying, in, let me put it this way, Dr. Lake said that praying in other tongues is the dynamo of the Spirit of God. And you remember the old days, a lot of people today wouldn't even know what a dynamo is, but in the old days they had these cranks that they would turn this thing, and as they cranked it, it would generate electricity. And then that electricity would go off into a line, into a battery, and it would charge up the battery. And the thing is, when they stopped charging, it was, that didn't when the electricity stopped, it was stored for later use. You didn't have to stand, well, as long as we want electricity, as long as we want lights, let's stand here and turn this thing. No, you turned it, and then you could stop. Remember that, maybe the illustration, again, <laughs> we don't have any of this stuff today. This is all you have to think back years ago. Remember the, maybe you've seen it in movies, the old telephones? Remember the old telephones you had on the wall? They had the speaker, and they had the thing you picked up and you held in your ear, and you had to crank it. And they'd always crank it first, and then they would talk. Why? Because they had to generate, right? some power to send out, and it would generate enough. But they didn't have to stand there the whole time talking and, and crank, right? Why? Because they could crank and then stop, and it would generate power and store it to be used. That's what speaking in other tongues does. It does you don't have to do it right then. That's why I tell people, you want to pray the perfect prayer? Pray in other tongues. That doesn't mean you have to pray the perfect prayer right then. You can, you can pray. When a person comes to me, many times, I don't know exactly what to pray. I don't know what to say. But the, what comes out is because I spent time praying in tongues and the Holy Spirit knew what was coming, knew those people would be standing in front of me, knew what they needed. And as I prayed in tongues, I didn't even know anything about them. But as I prayed in other tongues, he puts in, brings up inside of me what they need. So when I get in front of them, that's not the time to pray in tongues. I've already prayed in tongues. That's the time to use the power that's stored in the battery. You get that? And that's when I release it. I draw on the wisdom of God that was imparted through the praying in other tongues. Now, these are all aspects of this, and this is the aspects of walking in the realm of the Spirit. Now, we are obviously not going to get into 1 Corinthians today too far, because I wanted to, but I'm going to have to. Oop, losing stuff here. Sorry about that. There. That's pretty. <laughs> now, very quickly here. <clears throat> I'm not going to read a whole bunch of this, but I do want to read some parts. He says, he was writing... Uh, John Lake was writing to Charles Parham, who founded the Pentecostal movement back in 1901. And he wrote this March 24, 1927. He said, I've been wanting to write to you for a long time, but have been so very unsettled and things around me getting unsettled, I don't write to anybody until they begin to shape up again. He said, it'd be difficult to explain to you why I'm in Houston. This was written while he was in Houston, Texas. But he said, a something grew in my soul that I wanted to see and talk with Carruthers, W.A. Carruthers, one of the founders of the Assemblies of God. And it kept grinding in me so long that eventually I found myself here. He said, um, I'm trying to find a place here. Yep. Um, hmm. Where'd he go? Well, yeah, yeah, here it is. He said, we would, while at San Diego, I was in the habit of meeting with a few of the brethren in Los Angeles. Dr. Kenyon, that's E.W. Kenyon, uh, Dr. Cannon, Wallace, myself, and others, we would get together once in a while and talk things over. We did not discuss just the interests of the Pentecostal movement only, but whether or not there was anything that a group of sane men could do that would be of real value to Christianity. Now think about that. These guys get together and they're saying, what can we do to help Christianity, right? Not just our group. 
the consensus of opinion was that what the Christian world is suffering from more than anything else is a lack of the ideal of, Christ of Christianity. In other words, people don't know where we're going. They don't have the ideal. They don't see what Christianity is supposed to be. The world does not know what real Christianity is. Pentecost should have exemplified it. In that, it has failed, in my judgment, about 93%. Now think about that. This is a man that saw a quarter of a million healings in a 10-year period. I mean, amazing miracle. And he said, for the most part, about 93%, we have failed to show the world what real Christianity is. Now, and if he said that, imagine what his ideal of Christianity was, right? Most people would just like to walk in what he did. He says, however, it has done this much. It has demonstrated that there is such a thing as the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that men may enter into God if they will, that some have in a slight degree, that none have in an outstanding way that would make their life or revelation comparable with the apostles or the leaders of Christianity in the first centuries. Now, that's amazing for him to be able to say this. Then he goes on. We have rather been an order of cheap evangelism with a rather cheap evangelistic message that is not worthy in the high sense of being called Pentecostal. And think about that. He said, everything we've done has just been this cheap evangelistic type of stuff. He said, we've not real, we have not yet really seen real Christianity. And this was in 1927. Of course, he passed away in 1935. But up until that time, all of his South Africa mission trip and all that was all before this. His healing rooms in Spokane, the healing rooms in Portland, all that's already done and kind of over with about this point. And it's amazing. He says, and we still hadn't seen real Christianity yet. He said, we have this ideal. We got together and we talked about it. Now listen, he says, next, my own idea was that if I was going to, to undertake to do for Christianity the thing that seems to me that would be the greatest blessing and to present to the world the ideal that it needs of Christianity, I would like to do it through a sort of Bible university that first taught the full rounded life of Christ in man. Second, this Bible university would send into the world a group of men to give that ideal to the public. How my own soul has longed to see yourself, Charles Parham, above every other man, measure up in God to the stature of the need of this hour. And while I take my hat off to you and recognize in you a humble servant of God who has labored hard, and while you have been an amazing propagandist of the truth that God revealed to you, Yet, brother, like myself and all the others I see, there has been an utter failure to measure up to the stature of fatherhood in God that would mark you as the real father and leader of the Pentecostal forces. He was pretty blunt. <laughs> now, brother, I'm not scolding, and I'm sure that you know my deep love for the men who bear this gospel, especially for yourself, so that you will be ready to concede that my, my aim is not only to help you, but to help my, my own soul and the souls of those about us to rise up in God to be and do and give the real Pentecostal life and vision to the world. What I'm saying is that Dr. Lake said we have not yet recognized it. We've not yet seen this, but we, it's there. If we will push on into it, if we will walk in the things of the Spirit. Then he goes on and says, The great mass of independent churches in the Pentecostal faith have a local status. In other words, they're not really impacting the world. They're all trying to do something. One of the things we are all compelled to admit is that so far as real Pentecost is concerned, it is rapidly dying out in the world. That was in 1927. He said, what we've seen, most of that, it's dying out. Why? Because people have got too concerned and too satisfied with form and just going through things rather than actually experiencing the depths of God because everything has become now for an outward show rather than for an inward growth into the things of God. He said, if this is a real Pentecost, <clears throat> there must come out of it eventually the thing that Pentecost produced in the early church, and that was the real body of Jesus Christ, a group of Holy Ghost baptized souls in which dwell and through which is manifest the life of the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a lot here. I'm not going to read all of it, but it is amazing because he, he talked about some personal things with Charles Parham and what he should have seen, what they should have done. 
But the key here, and what I'm really wanting to get across to you is this. It's time for us to really settle down into the things of God. I'm not talking about moving away from healing. I'm not talking about doing... Yeah, that, that's all part of it. But what we have to see as a Christian is that a Christian is made up of, number one, the gifts of the Spirit. I'm not, when I say number one, I'm not talking about the main thing. I'm just I'm giving you the parts, okay? We should have the gifts of the Spirit operating in our lives, or at least the manifestation of the Spirit in these areas. That should be there. They should manifest the fruit of the Spirit, right? Now, gifts are given, fruit is grown. Gifts usually come instantly, but then fruit is grown and takes time to grow up into. And many times when people get gifts, and it's what I'm seeing in the church world right now, is that you've got a, a lot of people, typically young people, that get a hold of power and yet don't have fruit. They've got gifts of power, and they operate in power, but they don't have the fruit of the Spirit, which gives them the character to carry the gifts of the Spirit for any length of time. And what you're going to see are people that burn out and they go off into weird things or they get led astray because they don't have the stability of spirit to be able to walk it out and stay straight with God. And instead, they get off over into some tangent, over into some weird little doctrine that's going to steal what they've got. Because we have to remember, the enemy of our souls, the devil himself, is constantly trying to... He doesn't have to... Listen, he's not concerned about getting you to go to hell. All he's trying to do is make sure you're not effective here and now. Right? And to do that, all he has to do is get you off a little bit. And then pretty soon, you've got the form. You're doing everything right. You know, you're doing things that look... And yet, there's no real life. And because of that, you go off. And then other people see that. And, oh, you want to heal the sick? Oh, here's how you do it. Not, are you born again first? And then they learn how to heal the sick. And then they go out and heal the sick. And they're not even born again. You say, how, how can that happen? Jesus said, they, they're going to come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name? Haven't we done all these mighty works in your name? And you said, I never knew you. Why? Because you can preach to people and get them healed and you not be saved yourself. And you can get people healed and you can do these mighty works and yet the Spirit of God not be dwelling in you, but be working to help people. So, and I'm really concerned about the next generation where they're seeing power, but they're not seeing character, they're not seeing growth, they're not seeing the fruit of the Spirit. And then thirdly, we got the gifts, we got the fruit, and then thirdly, you have the nature and the character of God. The nature and character of God. All of these things together make a Christian. Not any one thing, but all of these things together build up into a Christian to be, so that a Christian can be a living, true example of the Son of God. Walking in the power of God, walking in the knowledge of God. All these things, that's what is going to come forth, and that is where we're going. Now, a lot of that is by giving the Spirit more control in you, and most of that comes through praying in other tongues. So that is going to be an emphasis that you're going to see more and more here as we go along, and a depth of that. So, I tell you what, I'm going to pray right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. I thank you for these people, and I thank you for those watching by internet, and watching by DVD, or listening by CD, or MP3, any format. If they're under the sound of my voice, I say in Jesus' name right now, by the Spirit of God, number one, get born again. Get, get born again. That means to repent, turn around, believe the gospel, walk with Jesus Christ, accept him as your Lord and Savior. Number two, ask for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Ask your Heavenly Father, if he is your Heavenly Father, ask him for the Spirit of God to overwhelm you and to flood you and to fill you. And even now, because he said if you ask, he will do it. So right now, Father, I thank you that these people right now are being filled, saved by the Spirit of God, filled to overflowing, baptized in the Spirit with the gifts, with the fruit, right now the fullness of the Spirit of God so that they may walk as sons and daughters of the living God. And even now, in Jesus' name, I bless them. I say be healed, be whole in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. What we're going to do, uh, yeah, actually, we'll do that too. We'll, we'll do that. We'll, go ahead. Let's, we're going <coughs> to receive our morning tithes and offerings. So we appreciate that. They're going to start to pass that around here. But we're going to move on into this. If you, ha if you need ministry, I'll be glad to minister to you.
and we're not we're not really done here. I don't want to you know I don't I don't want you to think we're going to get up and leave and all that kind of stuff. We're not done quite yet because I want us to put this into practice. So I want to take a few minutes. Uh, as, as we're going to take up the offering first, and then right after that, then we're going to take a few minutes and just minister in the Spirit of God. And I want you to begin to, if if you pray in other tongues, you speak in other tongues, begin to speak in other tongues and let that come out. I will I will guide you in this in just a minute. Uh, let's go ahead and do the offering real quick and get that out of the way so we can move right on into this. Now we're not interrupting the flow of the Spirit here. This is part of worship. So Father, we bless these finances coming in. We receive them. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we multiply them back to the givers in Jesus' name, overflowing in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And while we're doing that, just prepare yourself even now to begin speaking in other tongues as we get started. But I do want to, uh, this is something, I was talking to my wife yesterday. We were driving, and, you know, I tell everybody this every day, or pretty much every time I ever speak, about how blessed I am. It's amazing. And it struck me yesterday while we were driving how blessed we are. And I can tell you right now, standing before you, I have never asked God for a blessing. I don't pray that way. I've not, we don't pray for finances. You know, we don't, we, I, oh, God, bless me, help me. God, I need money. God, I don't, I, we don't do that. We've, we've never, I've never done that. We, I have sown, we've reaped, I've believed those things, and I grew in these things. But I can tell you right now, and I, I, it's funny because I told my wife, I said, you know, it's amazing looking at this. We are living Deuteronomy 28. In other words, we are, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. We're living right with God. We're doing these things, and I'm not praying for a blessing. And it's amazing because Deuteronomy 28 says he will cause all of these blessings to overtake you. In other words, I'm not trying to get them, I'm living, I, I've been overtaken by the blessing of God, and I've not prayed for them, and honestly, most of my time praying is praying for other people, and people ask me all the time, you know, pray that God will bless our finances, or pray, that, and we do, and I'm telling you, I, I pray for people, and I'm living in the blessing of that, what I, what I sow, I reap, when I pray for others, I get the benefit of that, but I don't think in terms of go do this for that, it's amazing. And I'm telling you, it, it is the easiest thing in the world to walk in this. It's not hard. And people say, well, yeah, but you know, you're, you're a preacher, so people give you money and that kind of stuff. That's not necessarily always true. You know, I believe God. Now, what I mean is, I, when I say I believe God, I'm not saying I'm believing God in a sense that I've stated this need and need that answer. I believe God takes care of me. I believe that I'm his child. I believe if I wasn't preaching, he would still take care of me. Amen? It's not because I'm a preacher that he takes care of me. He takes care of me because I'm his son. You get that? And because I live in that. Now, how we, how we live, I, I'm telling you, and, and at some point here, before, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to actually teach on some of these things. And most of you know my stand on finances and things and what we talk about, what we don't talk about. But I'm gonna, we're going to do a closed-door session. In other words, we're going to come in here, probably won't be anybody here but my staff, and I'm going to teach on finances for two days. And we're going to teach you on kingdom finance. It's not going to be open to the public. It's not going to be inviting anybody in or it's not going to be broadcast. I'm just going to teach it. And then afterwards, we're going to make that available. And you say, well, why would you do it that way? Because if I said we're going to teach on finances, then we would have people fly in here and come here because they think this is going to be a finance seminar and this is going to be a prosperity seminar. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to sow and I'm going to get this. And he's going to pray that, I, that this financial bondage will be broken and we're not doing that I, I'm, I'm not putting on a seminar to get people to come here to give you understand so I can teach on finances it's going to be closed it's going to be where I can just teach what the spirit of God and what the word of God says concerning finances and I'm going to show and I'm going to teach you how we live in this and how this, this is ongoing and how to activate this in your life so that you can live in this, this blessing this overflow blessing and then we're going to put that teaching out there for people. And we're going to make it available and not make it based on when you come in and you're going to sow and get this, you know, if you give, what is it, $77.75 or $0.77 cents and you're going to get the, you know, the 100-fold. But we're not doing any of that stuff, right? I'm going to teach you what the Word of God says and your connection will be between you and God. And it's not going to have anything to do with manipulation or what I call, you know, <laughs> Christianized extortion. Right? We're not doing that. 
But I, but I want you to understand this. This is available for anybody. Amen? Amen. And I want to teach you how to, how to live as sons in the blessing of God. So, I'm going to pray for you right now. Father, in Jesus' name. Father, I know two areas, healing and finances, where people are held in bondage so much. So right now, right now, Father, we know that both of these bondages have been broken by the sacrifice of your son. And because of this, we can walk in the blessing of not just healing, but divine health. And not just prosperity, but divine prosperity. And Father, I thank you that we live as truly wealthy people. In the sense, Father, not that we have money stacked up, but the truly wealthy person is the one that knows that they can get their hands on what they need when they need it. And because we know you're our Father, that we know we can ask and you will give us what we need when we need it. And Father, I thank you that that makes us true Christians, true of the body of Christ, makes us truly wealthy, prosperous people. So Father, I thank you even now that, that this, this mentality uh, of, of, of usury in the church is broken. And Father, I thank you that by the Spirit of God, you give us all things that pertain to life and godliness, that you provide for us, and that you gave us these things with Jesus. They don't come separately. But Father, we thank you that even now, that bondages and mental blockages and mental strongholds are broken that would cause people to think in line with the traditions of men that have been built up over this. So Father, I thank you now in Jesus' name that there's freedom, there's health, there's healing, there is prosperity, there is a, a blessing that we, can, we have been blessed so that we may be a blessing. And Father, I thank you that that is coming to fruition in the church in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.